For four days in January, a sprawling gas plant in the Algerian Sahara became the scene of one of the most audacious extremist attacks in recent memory. Some 800 workers were taken hostage, menaced with murder by a group of gunmen, including two Canadians from London, Ontario. The hostage-taking ended in slaughter. Dozens died. What happened inside that compound is a story CBC News has investigated closely and brought to you in exclusive reports. Tonight, we go even deeper. The CBC's Nala Ayat spoke with hostages who survived those four deadly days. For the first time, they tell their stories in this special report. A militant group linked to Al Qaeda Ambitious may seem an odd word to describe an act of terror, but that's one thing it most certainly was brutally ambitious, one of the boldest in recent memory. Yet all we have are murky images like these ghastly glimpses that fail to answer key questions. Just how do you take some 800 people hostage or plan to blow up a gas field sky high? What role did Canadians play? Faces we've come to know, but not the details of their deeds. And how did the hostages cope? Tonight, survivors share some horrific memories they may never forget. In my mind, you're not supposed to die there. You're taken hostage, people come and rescue you, you negotiate, you escape, you, you I don't know, you, it's so many things that you are supposed to come out of there alive. And so when, when somebody tells you that people are dead, now you really, you are devastated. One look at a map and the isolation of the Inaminas gas plant is striking. Utterly lonely, it seems, in an infinity of Saharan sand, not far from the Libyan border. So remote. If you worked there, you slept there a month at a time. Home was the Baz de Vie, or the living quarters, and work a short drive away. The main gas facility, a 24-7 operation. So where would most people have been that morning when uh, the attack started, do you think? Uh, the guys that were in the plant area, uh, the majority of them would have been in this office. Since his career started in Alaska, Nick Frazier used rotational fieldwork to see the world. The lucrative opportunity to go to Algeria was more adventurous, but after asking around, he decided to seize it. When I first took the job, I used the first couple rotations to get a feel for it, knowing in my mind, if I don't feel comfortable, then I'll just quit. And I never, I never felt that way. On the contrary, Frazier made himself at home at Inaminas, month on, month off, for six years. After nearly three years of working in the country, American electrical engineer Chris Castro was no stranger to Algeria or to its sea of sand. And with his Ecuadorian roots, Castro was often mistaken for Algerian, and that, a co-worker once advised him, could one day save his life if he used it right. He said to me, uh, Chris, if you ever get stopped by the terrorists or you're in trouble, all you have to do is just pretend you're in shock and you go, Gonna talk. And so okay, I say, okay, fine. Uh. But for all it had going for it, Inaminas may have been destined to be a target. On the dark, frigid morning of January 16, a convoy of well armed militants hurtled towards it, carrying good intelligence and bad intentions. What the militants were putting into action is what appeared to be a well organized plan to take over and destroy the gas facility here, and at the same time invade the living quarters right over here and take as many foreign hostages as possible. But their first contact may have been a surprise on the road here with a bus leaving the plant. Among the passengers on that bus, all foreigners, was American Nick Fraser. 
It's so early, it's still dark when the bus leaves for town, protected by an armed military escort. But not a kilometer down the road, just shy of a checkpoint, a signal trouble is ahead. I heard uh, a loud boom. I could see red streaks passing. Uh, the first a couple and then many, many, many. And uh, it took me a while to put it together, but I realized those are bullets. It was constant, it was incessant. It was like rain on a, on a tin roof, just ba 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 just for 30 minutes straight. There's just so many bullets that it doesn't seem like you'll ever, you'll ever make it. Despite the chaos around him, Frazier had the presence of mind to message his wife, Melissa. Did you feel the need to give her a message of some kind, given you thought you were going to die? Well, I never said goodbye or anything like that. And I think I thought a lot about that. And I think it was because I didn't want to, to give up hope. I didn't have any regrets. I was happy because uh, I had a one-year-old son, and I was happy that uh, he was born and that he was going to, to live beyond me. When the shooting stopped, the passengers jumped out of the bus and crawled flat in the sand towards the army. For them, it was over. They were lucky to be alive. By then, the militants are well into the premises, and some workers get caught in the crossfire in the parking lot. They hit the ground and wait for hours, and when they emerge, it is unluckily straight into the hands of the militants. Among the hostages is senior technician Joseph, or Jojo, Balmaceda. Hold us and then, what is your uh, nationality? We are Filipino. On our back, there is one American guy named Fred Botasio. And then the other guy. What is your uh, nationality? Nationality, nationality. Uh, American. Then they start to raise their guns and they shout, Allah Wakbar. Then after they put us a, a plastic cable tie on my hand and feet. The attackers knew exactly where to find most of the workers at that hour, at the living quarters here, preparing for another day, or perhaps at the restaurant having breakfast. But a security alarm had been pulled by an Algerian guard who was then shot. So some of the workers knew there was a threat and locked themselves in their rooms. On their eager hunt for foreigners, the militants would have to go door to door. Already on his way to work, Chris Castro realizes he's under fire. So he runs back into a room with two others and locks the door until the militants kicking in doors are on the other side of theirs. By that time, all three of us are inside the shower with a curtain drawn covering us. They come in and they take the two of my friends out first. And he missed me at the beginning, the militant. But somehow he, he, he had realized he didn't have not roll the, the curtain all the way uh, out. So immediately he came back, and that's when I, I was taken hostage. He pointed AK-47 at me and um, uh, talking to me in foreign language. I just went the natural. <laughs> One of the militants who was standing watch at a distance from, from this group, signals me to move away, not to go there. So only then, at that moment, it clicked. I realized that uh, indeed I have been truly taken for an Arab, which I was very, very glad. Algerians had been assured it was foreigners the militants were after, so they were not tied up and they could use their phones. Some even took pictures like this one. Embedded among them is Chris Castro, hoping no one would blow his implausible cover of being an Algerian shocked into speechlessness. 
I can see the cook, I can see so many people, but not one ever, ever uh, went to the militants and say, he's not, he's not an Arab. In fact, as the day went on, as uh, the people that I knew would actually protect me. Uh, they would get in front of me because I, 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 at some point I got, I got maybe uh, too confident. But the militants seem satisfied. They have American and British hostages, hands and feet bound, some even made to wear explosives around their necks. But what the militants don't know is that there are many more foreigners on the premises than anyone's let on. Through texts and calls to loved ones, word was reaching the outside world from those who had managed to hide, huddling behind cupboards, beneath floorboards, under beds, and even in roof crawl spaces. What emerges is a daunting picture of the desperation at the complex, what could either be a map of tragedy or one of hope. When we come back, how do some 40 civilians who have come from around the world to make a living end up dead? And what role does one particular blonde militant have to play? It's a guy that you can meet on the street and you can trust and be a good neighbor. And so I, I, I'll never forget his face. As the hours slip by, the desperation is seeping in, especially among the hostages who are face to face with the militants. What to read into their movements, into the vast arsenal they brought along, and what to make of the blonde militant who speaks perfect English. Uh, he has uh, eyeglasses, same as uh, John Lennon, and he. Uh, he was skinny. And a bird, a small bird. This is me. We are five here. We are five Filipinos here. Balmaceda is in close proximity to the blonde man for much of his harrowing time in captivity and has a close up view of what he was up to. He starts to negotiate. He is in front of us. I heard on the phone that if you will not follow our demand to pull out the troop, we will start to kill up the hostages here every one hour. Oh, so, so afraid and so tense. He shut off the phone, said to me, it will not happen. We will just make a bluff. Just the act of going in this plant like that. Chris Castro remembers his fatigues, his athletic face, and especially his composure. They were in control. He was not yelling. He was not fast pacing, uh, back and forth, running around. And, and to me, after a while, that was the scary part, that these, these people were like, they had rehearsed this attack a thousand times and and even then I, I wonder what is this this fellow doing here with such a um, demeanor tone presence just sheer presence he could be an electrical engineer some profession where you don't you don't have to be in this business of uh, uh, threatening killing people or be killed In a country accustomed to militant violence, the involvement of a foreigner is news that moves awfully fast. We spoke to one Algerian who worked at the plant, who met him face to face. Mohammed agreed to speak to us only if we hid his identity and change his name to protect him. He called me using uh, a very formal Arabic, you know, the one we, we use only at school. He said, we are looking for the experts, where are they? And um, I said uh, in Arabic, uh, sorry, I don't understand. And then he said, uh, uh, okay, okay, you, you can go, you can go. But I saw him again uh, a couple of times 
because he was he was a kind of very active and very smart, moving very very quickly between the the, the members of his group and asking people and so on. And uh... the man they recognize is London, Ontario native Chris Katsarumas. This is the guy. I'm 100% sure. It's strange. I can understand a guy living in the uh, deep. Uh, deep south of Algeria or in northern Mali, uh, very poor, uh, no future, everything, uh, uh, joining this kind of groups. But the guy living in Ontario, I don't know. I didn't understand. This is the one who is uh, talking on the phone. Yes, very sure. I recognize him. He, he looked older, but his features didn't have changed very little. He's a guy that you can meet on the street and you can trust, and, and so I, I, I'll never forget his face. By Thursday, the plant is surrounded by Algerian forces, and they mount an assault without informing Western governments. Terrified by the crash of mortars, most Algerian workers, Mohammed and Chris Castro included, simply walk out. Too busy and outnumbered, the militants do nothing to stop them. That morning, no longer calm, the militants seem agitated as they prepare for a move. Jojo Balmaceda watches as Canadian Chris Katsarubis helps to quickly assemble improvised bombs for the journey. Vehicles are lined up, hostages are bound, and some made to wear explosives. It seems they're taking them to the refinery, and it seems they are now human shields. Balmaceda and a close friend are forced into the back of one of the vehicles. Also inside, a suicide bomber, holding a trigger at the ready. As they move, bullets start to fly. When I hear the gunshot coming from the from the chopper, one of my colleagues was being hit. He just made a uh, three deep breath, then he lost his life. He died in in my arms. Then after that, maybe the the driver was being hit also, and the suicide bomber. Uh, the only thing I heard was uh, Allah Wakbar, then bam. Then, then after that, I tried to hold on my my head, my my body. That oh, I'm still alive. Luckily, I'm still alive. Nothing is going according to plan for the militants. No successful negotiations. No way out. In a desperate act, they pack a car with explosives, gather the hostages, and set off a fiery finale, killing those hostages and themselves. In one chapter or another of the four-day bloodbath, Canadians Chris Katsarubas and Ali Medlidge were also killed. To have been near death but then live comes with intolerable guilt and impossible questions. For the survivors of Ain Aminas, there are also nightmares, injuries, and the psychological damage to contend with. All my best friend, my, my, co my co-worker, uh, sadly, they did not make it. They all dead. Uh, what are my feelings? It's, uh, disgusting, very emotionally. I don't remember. I don't want to remember what happened to them. I just want to remember the happy days we are being together, our bonding times. Mixed in is also relief, and for some, deep gratitude. People do things here for you. Uh, that they risk their own life in the in the in the midst of this attack or this incident, 
with the death and uh, maiming of people. Uh, there's so much humanity I want to express at this very moment. The worst is seeing uh, some, uh, some of the friends I know sitting uh, beside this wall with the... They were tight, looking at us, we were looking at them. I, I hope they understand. We were not able to help them. Yeah, sorry. My whole image of the world has changed and my ability to, to trust is virtually disappeared, <laughs> so. So much lost in such a small patch of land in a short four days. What we may never fully understand is why. And Nala joins us now. Nala, how hard was it to get these people to talk to you? It was extremely difficult because they just want to get past all of this and they have a lot to get past. Joe Jabal Maceda has hearing problems because of the explosion he witnessed. He and Nick Fraser have nightmares and they jump at every at any noise. Uh, Castro has a lot of guilt because he survived and many others didn't and Mohammed has the double wound of dealing with the past violence of Algeria but also reliving all of this and what's going on in, in the country itself. So they want to get past all of this. They don't want to talk about it anymore. Nala, thank you. Nala Ayad. And there is a lot more on this story on cbcnews.ca, including a behind-the-scenes look at how our cameraman and graphic artist used the few available images of the gas plant attack to bring the experiences of the survivors to life. Also, an interactive map of the plant showing where the survivors were held and telling the tale of the attack through their eyes.